So I think time is up and the webinar is about to start. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's H2 Bus Talks webinar. My name is Nina Jord and I am the Director of Strategy and Market Development at Balak Power Systems in Europe and I will be your host today. Now across the globe, environmental challenges and CO2 emission uh, regulations are forcing cities to rethink public transportation. We are excited to welcome you to this first episode of a planned series of H2 Bus Talks webinars conducted by the H2 Bus Europe project, focusing on how the deployment of fuel cell electric buses will play a key role in getting cities and regions to meet their zero emission goals without compromising on three key areas, range, road flexibility, and operability. Now, the H2 Bus Europe project is a project focusing on scaling up the deployment of zero emission fuel cell buses across Europe. The consortium consists of leading players in the fuel cell bus and hydrogen value chain. And here we have Ballet Power Systems, Everfuel, Hexagon Composites, Null Hydrogen, Rice Hydrogen, and Right Bus. This consortium is committed to deploying 1,000 hydrogen fuel cell electric buses, along with supporting infrastructure in European cities at commercially competitive rates. And today we decided to put a spotlight on Denmark, as Denmark is one of the leading countries when it comes to issuing zero emission tenders for its public transportation. In June last year, six of the largest cities in Denmark entered into an agreement which stated that from 2021, all newly purchased city buses must be zero emission. And this obligation really presents a great opportunity for these six cities to become first movers if they deploy fuel cell electric buses in their bus fleet. And with this virtual event, we wish to leave you all with the awareness and the knowledge about the fuel cell electric buses as a ready to implement technology, a competitive alternative to battery electric buses, and as the only option to a 100% zero emission solution for public transportation. Today's presentations build up on successful trials of fuel cell buses across Europe. And we have a group of experts from the H2 Bus Europe Consortium joining us. Our first presenter is David York. He's the Market Development Manager at Ballard Power Systems Europe. And David will elaborate on the benefits of deploying fuel cell buses now, David has a strong experience in deploying fuel cell buses from an operator's point of view, as he was leading the fuel cell bus deployments for Tower Transit in London for more than 10 years prior to joining Ballard. And to present the fuel cell bus, we will be joined by Nathan Hutch, head of Right Bus International. And Nathan has been with Right Bus for more than 10 years. And Rightbus is one of the leading fuel cell bus manufacturers in the world, having deployed fuel cell buses since 2011. Then we will be joined by Lars Jacobson, the sales director at Everfuel, who will tell us about scalable, sustainable hydrogen fueling infrastructure. And Lars has more than 10 years of experience in hydrogen and fuel cells, and he worked for Nell Hydrogen Solutions prior prior to being one of the founding partners of Everfuel in 2019. The last presentation will focus on service and training and will be given jointly by Nathan Hodge from Rightbus and Lars Husted, the European service manager from Ballard, who has been leading the service and support of all fuel cell buses powered by Ballard fuel cells since 2012. And finally, just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them, in, them into the chat during the webinar. 
and we will have time for answering questions during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And if you are experiencing any connectivity issues, we would advise you to potentially close uh, other programs running in the background. This would uh, help, we believe. And with that, I think now we can begin, and I'd like to hand it over to you, David. Thank you very much, Nina. Um, could I ask you, Nina, to change the slides for me? Because I, 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 I have a problem there. So if you could do that for me, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, at the moment, there's only two zero emission bus options that you can have either a battery electric bus or a fuel cell hydrogen bus. The benefits of a fuel cell hydrogen bus are, um, are very well publicized, um, but some of the main ones are, are on this slide. So a fuel cell hydrogen bus can be a one-to-one one -one replacement for a diesel bus. So the schedules you're running now with a diesel are exactly the same as what you need to run with a fuel cell hydrogen bus. Also, on a fuel cell hydrogen bus, there's there's no range issues that you've got. We've got almost the same range as a diesel bus. So again, that is very, very useful. And so you don't have any range exact anxiety that you may have with a battery electric bus. With a hydrogen fuel cell bus, we have rapid refueling. So we're talking about refueling in minutes. Um, again, with a battery electric bus, you could have a problem because your fueling could take could take many hours. And also another issue, particularly in uh, colder climates, is you don't have any heating problems um, and you don't. There's definitely no need for any auxiliary diesel heaters or anything like that. So, you know, you're going to get a zero emission bus, a 100 percent zero emission bus all year round. You change the slide, Nina. But alongside that, there's more what I would call soft benefits. So things that may not be well publicized, but you have to think about when you're operating a, a, bus, a bus service. So as I already briefly mentioned, the schedules that you can run with a hydrogen fuel cell bus are exactly the same as, as needs to be run with a diesel. So many bus routes are quite traditional. They may have been running on the same route for many, many, many years. And passengers expect the buses to be running at the same frequency, um, the same route and everything. So with the schedules that you've got, there's no compromise when you move from diesel to fuel cell electric. Another very important thing as far as an operator is concerned is that there's no changes to any of the depot processes. A hydrogen fuel cell bus can be can be um, run from the depot in exactly the same way. So the bus goes out in the morning, is out all day, comes back, gets cleaned, washed, refueled, parked, and ready to go in the morning. There's some very well established processes within the depot of how to turn around a bus in the in in the evening and there's no change to that if you're talking about a battery electric bus you may well have to have a sort of first in first out type approach to uh to the to the depot processes with some battery electric vehicles because of the the lack of range there is opportunity charging on the route now, on the face of it, opportunity charging sounds like a very, very good option and does work. However, there are some serious issues to do with opportunity charging. First, who owns the charger? Who maintains the charger? Where's the charger going to go? And those sort of things. But if you've got the charger at the end of the route, at the terminus at each end of the route, and the bus comes in and needs to charge for 10 minutes that may well look like it can fit in with the schedule but what a lot of schedules are written on bus routes where you have a bit of leeway at the end of the route so if the bus is a few minutes late you can still start the next route on time but if you have to have a certain period of time where the bus needs to have a charge 
um, happen to it, then then it can mean that that you you don't have enough time. You, you don't you you sorry. You need to charge the bus for that time, and so any delay in the first route of the day could knock on through to the rest of the day. Also, if you have a number of routes sharing the same charger, if a different route is running late and there's a bus on the charger at that time and you and your bus is meant to be on there, then it could mean that someone else's another schedule or another route knocks all the routes out out of timing for the whole day. So that can be a serious problem. The buses within the depot, if you're running hydrogen fuel cell buses, can can be put on any route. So you don't have a route type bus. Again, if you have one route that has opportunity charging with a battery electric bus and one route that doesn't, it doesn't give you the flexibility in the shed in in the in the depot to put a different bus onto the route at some time. So by having this flexibility, it could lead you to having less spares in the depot that you need. During the life of the buses, and we're generally talking five, ten years of a bus or, or on a bus tender, you are going to get some diversions, you are going to get some roadworks, you are going to get some hold-ups on the route. Again, a hydrogen fuel cell bus is flexible and you're not you, you you're not tied or you're not worried with any range anxiety or anything if the route takes longer than that so you have the full flexibility now as you do with the diesel bus if you do the next slide please so what does the consortium have to offer well first of all competitive prices and and that that's just uh with your capital cost and your and your complete tco cost total cost of ownership cost but the consortium as well can offer you some other things. So within the consortium, members have been running hydrogen fuel cell buses for many years. So we know what to do to implement these buses and we can help any, any operator get the buses into service, help them when they're running the service. And through the, through the lifetimes of, of the bus, we can help with that. We can help with any changes that's required to any maintenance facilities. We've done this before. We know what we're doing. We have and we can develop a lot of local contacts within the support network. So we already have those contacts within the consortium and we can expand that and help and help that. Um, and, and pass those on to the operator when you're when you're running hydrogen fuel cell buses. With a large scale deployment, we can also use our contacts to use to use promotion. Fuel cell buses are started to be taken up in larger numbers, but there is an opportunity to promote your town, your operation, your company. In, in the development of hydrogen fuel cell buses. So there's a definite opportunity uh, there to, to, for promotion. And finally, the thing is that we're ready to start deploying buses today. There are hydrogen fuel cell buses being deployed today. We've deployed them for many years. And so we're ready to get going. So with that, I'm gonna hand you on to Nathan, who's gonna talk about specifically about the bus more. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, David, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, my name is Nathan Hodge, and I'm the head of Wright Bus International. I'm here to talk to you today about uh, Bamford Bus Company treating as Wright Bus and what we're doing in the fuel cell electric vehicle market. So a question we'll get started with is who are Wright Bus? So Rightbus were founded in 1946 and in the UK market have always seen to have been the first to move. So the first to integrate low floor technology, the first for hyperelectric, first for electrification, opportunity charging, and most importantly, the first to integrate fuel cell electric vehicles. It was the movement in fuel cell electric vehicles which attracted Joe Bumford to acquire the business in October 2019. Joe has some incredibly exciting uh, 
plans to transform UK public transport. He is believes there is a possibility to integrate up to 4,000 hydrogen buses by 2024. Right Bus had been manufacturing hydrogen buses, as Nina says, with Ballard since 2010. The, the world's first hydrogen double-decker bus went into production in 2020. Right Bus and currently employs over 600 people with two manufacturing facilities, one in Northern Ireland satisfying the market in Europe and one in Malaysia satisfying the market in Southeast Asia. We have a full range of zero emission solutions, including battery electric vehicles. As I said, we've always been somebody that's first to move and we were the first, we believe, to uh, create a dedicated research facility at a tertiary level, dedicated for buses and public services, public transport. Uh, it's called WTEC, it's in collaboration with Queen's University. So what's good about WTEC is we can conduct high level PhD and postdoctorate research academic work for our customers in driveline simulation, and TCO modeling and advanced composite, uh, lightweight technology engineering. And it's also a fantastic talent pool for Right Bus. Uh, very recently, our first ever PhD student, Dr. Robert Best, uh, last year became our new engineering director. And two of his PhD students that he's taken through the process are now employed in engineering. So is this ever improving, ever changing dynamic and integration with software, having this fantastic talent pool sets Right Bus up for an exciting future? So Bamford Bus Company uh, is a group of companies. You can actually see the uh, facility. It's an 80-acre facility capable of producing up to 5,000 buses per year. Um, the after-sales department, the bus manufacturing, the chassis manufacturing is all completed on-site in a completely integrated system. We have the custom care division uh, under custom care. We have Right Bus International, which is a company registered in Singapore with wholly owned subsidiaries in Malaysia and uh, Hong Kong. Right Bus International actually has over 3,000 buses in daily operation in Hong Kong and Singapore with a market share of around 40%. Right Bus is very, very much famous and synonymous uh, globally and seen a number of movies and even a Jaguar TV advert uh, for the new bus for London. It's a company which has done a lot of iconic projects including work in Las Vegas uh, for the Las Vegas streetcar. N-Drive is the chassis manufacturing company and Metallics is the metal fabrication company. So as, as Nina has said, fuel cell bus experience, we've been had our buses in operation since 2011. Um, David actually at that stage worked on that project a lot in his time in First Group and Tar Transit and knows how successful the project was. What was really great about this project was the learning experience both Ballard and Right Bus took into the future of fuel cell technology for the European market. In 2016, Right Bus uh, decided and believed that there was limitations in the range, the flexibility and the operability of battery electric vehicles alone, and that the next generation of fuel cell technology was what the market required. So we started the process in making our Gen 2 uh, fuel cell, and we were successful in winning Jive uh, tender which was the first movement of bringing fuel cell buses from one million pounds per bus to half a million pounds, which was more comparable and more commercially competitive with other technologies. As part of that process, as part of that process, uh, Right Bus um, had a key strategy. How could we take it from one million euros to half a million? We believed that we had to make a hydrogen production line. We had to build the buses in the same way we build everything else. All the buses in the the uh, last 15 years have been built one-offs by different people that created problems and concerns with the technology because one vehicle had one problem, another vehicle had another. There was inefficiencies of costs, after sales and components. So we, we decided to start a, a technology platform to consolidate along with our battery electric vehicles and our uh, diesel vehicles to ensure uh, commodities were used the same. We've delivered uh, our first vehicles, went into operation in 2020. You may have seen some of the press releases around that in Aberdeen. 15 vehicles have been delivered by Right Bus between October and January 21, with 60 vehicles expected to be delivered between February and December this year, and with the planned output in 2022 of 150 units. Right Bus's product offering and one of the benefits from our driveline simulation is we have all the technologies and we have all the different product types. We have single deck and double deck, we have diesel, we have hybrid, we have battery electric vehicles, and in the bottom left of the hand corner, you can see we have fuel cell electric vehicles. 
So we've talked about the first two generations of the Right Bus product in 2011. We also talked about the Jive product in Generation 2. Now we're going to talk about what H2 bus products look like for Right Bus and the Generation 3 of our hydrogen fuel cell technology. So Generation 3 for us is a movement to be cost comparative to uh, battery electric vehicles. It's for the passenger, we see the vehicles looking very similar to diesel or battery electric vehicles. One of the benefits to that is because our battery packs are actually kept under the purple section you can see in the top uh, image uh, around the wheelchair, they're kept in the floor line. So effectively the batteries are out of sight and the hydrogen tanks in our double deck are kept behind the rear five seats or on the roof. Our, our product range for our next generation platform, which started R&D in 2019 and will start delivering in Q1 2022, will come in single deck, will come in double deck, one door, two door, three door, left hand and right hand drive. They also include our lightweight aluminium body construction. What's brilliant about the lightweight aluminium body construction is it gives us class leading energy efficiency because our body weight is significantly lighter than our competitors who build with steel bodies. We have a chassis with a low floor chassis with batteries mounted underneath, um, 50 kilowatt LTO batteries. One of the benefits of the battery choice we've taken with our partner 4C is that we use VDA compliant batteries. The VDA compliance is a, a German standard, which a um, certain number of key suppliers are now building to, which means all battery technologies are built to the same height, which means in the future we can change from one supplier to another supplier depending on what we think is the best engineering solution or what our customer requests without having to make fundamental changes to our design. We're also incorporating the Ballard FC Move uh, 70 kilowatt fuel cell stack, which we believe is class leading. With a range of up to 500 kilometers, um, we believe that gives you fantastic range, uh, operability and flexibility, all the points that David and Nina have discussed. Our estimated uh, consumption of six kilograms per 100 kilometers, we think actually in real world testing is, is proving better than that. One of the, the, the challenges of our uh, second generation fuel cells, which are now in operation, they had to start their operation in the middle of winter, the coldest winter for 12 years with up to minus 20 degrees Celsius uh, temperatures. Uh, they were had to significant challenges, but the heating and range has proved fantastic. Uh, with the free heat movement created from the Ballard fuel cell, we, we believe that this gives consistency for passengers, we think in Northern Europe, in places like Denmark, that's a real cause of concern. During a very cold winter, will your buses be able to conduct the range they can on a standard winter? And that's something we believe the flexibility is important. In terms of the design, uh, the design is got a large level of synergy with our diesel and our battery electric vehicles. So the axles on our uh, battery electric vehicles and fuel cell are the same. That gives us lots of benefits from a scheduling perspective because we're not in a situation where we're ordering bespoke long lead times for certain components. And that allows us to be able to deliver products and after sale support in a comparative lead time uh, to what we offer in our diesel products. So as a, as a, as a summary for us, what does hydrogen fuel cell technology through H2 Bus Europe look? It looks like a very cost competitive, zero emission alternative solution, which can be utilized in a vast array of different areas. But one of the key things about this is also the integration with the green hydrogen uh, technology and the scalable. So I'm now gonna pass you over to Lars to talk about that in more depth. Thank you, Nathan. And I actually control the slides. Thank you very much, everyone, and welcome again. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about the, the infrastructure and the hydrogen. Just a few slides, maybe only one, about Everfuel. So we uh, have set up Everfuel in 2019 with the aim of actually providing you as a PTO or other customer with hydrogen, just like you order any other fuel. <clears throat> we are dedicated to, to hydrogen because we believe that this is the heavy duty fuel of the future plays very well in, in line with the renewables that we are being implemented, especially in Northern Europe, Denmark in specific, which is our focus today. We are already a listed company on Euro Next Growth, so on, on the Oslo Stock Exchange, we entered the stock market in 2020, but we are still very much a Danish company with our headquarters just south of Herne. And we have started the operation in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Germany and in the Netherlands, which is our key markets. 
if you look in the bottom of this slide, you can see the hydrogen value chain. As Nina said, I have, a, together with my founding colleagues, a history of nil hydrogen. <clears throat> nil hydrogen produces hardware. And inside nil hydrogen, we actually sold hardware. So selling you potentially a hydrogen refueling station was what I did on a regular basis. Not every day, but on a regular basis. <clears throat> and we could see that it, it was a very nice product. It worked very good. But if you looked at, uh, at the entire value chain and the end price for the customer actually fueling it into a bus, then the price was often, or every more like 100%, too high to actually be commercially attractive. Why was that? If we looked at the value chain, it was not optimized. So the design, the actual hardware, didn't always fit the actual um, the need and demand that the customer had. And together with the hydrogen distribution, this was one of the low-hanging fruits that we could optimize. So we have uh, developed our own trailers with our own IP, integrated them as a part of the actual station to improve the performance and thus lowering the price for the end customer. We can also take other parts of the value chain. We can either own the production ourselves, so electrolyzer based on renewable energy, or we can partner with other ambitious partners. Our key target is to have a very attractive price for the customer at the pump. So our target is that it will cost the same as driving diesel, and we can actually achieve that already today. Everfuel as a company, we saw the need that someone stepped in and took the responsibility. So if you do a hydrogen fueling facility at a depot or wherever you want us to do this, we will take full responsibility and we will also take the entire investment. So we will look exactly at the need, for instance, um, what route, what the operational patterns do you have, when do you need to refuel, how much, for how long and how many dispensers. So we will put that into our equation and do the exact perfect design solution for you. We will then take responsibility for the permitting, the construction, the installation, the certification, the operation, and the service and maintenance, as well as the green hydrogen supplied throughout the contract. I think typical uh, zero emission contracts in Denmark start with 10 years, and we are of course flexible to meet exactly the needs that you have. We put everything into the price of the fuel and take care of that at a transparent uh, level of also the cost for you as an end customer and also do the indexing. The key is that we actually have very, very high capacity with a minimum footprint and specifically on the, the grid needs that, that we have to, to actually do the refueling, it's much lower than what you have when you do a battery electric bus. Talking about green hydrogen, this is Denmark as a case and uh, if you have been looking a little bit in the press and uh, are a little bit informed about the industry, a lot on power to x is going on. Luckily, we are involved in a lot of these uh, projects. We have our own production facility being set up next to the refinery in Fredericia, where we have a 20 megawatt electrolyzer <clears throat> producing up to eight tons of hydrogen a day. Some of that hydrogen goes to the refinery to use in their processes, but we still have a lot of hydrogen that we can use for mobility, among other things. In average, you should imagine that one bus uses 25 kilograms a day, so the eight tons will take us a long way. And luckily, if we run out there, we can scale it or use some of the other sources. For instance, in Brande, we have a nice setup together with Siemens Gamesa, Green Hub Denmark is coming up, and so is Green Lab Ski, where we're also in, involved and we can pick up the hydrogen on Sealand. We can also do the same in Avedaria together with Öster, where we have a joint project. So the, the Hydrogen produced and delivered in Denmark is green, but being on the grid, you can of course not say that it's 100% green, but we of course certify that to meet the needs of the PTA. How we take it from the production side I just showed you to the, to the actual depots. So we use dispen uh, trailers to take it to the dispensers. As, as I said previously with the value chain, it was suboptimal when we looked at it. So previously you, you just uh, moved a lot of metal so you had two to 300 kilograms of hydrogen in a trailer at not too, too high pressure. We changed that because we saw a need for that. So we transport roughly 1.1 ton of compressed green hydrogen in the trailer. And it's the same fleet of trailers that we use all over Europe. <clears throat> so they can actually do backup for each other. This goes to the depot and there it's integrated into the hardware, which I will now show you. So at the, at the station, it meets the trailer panel where it's connected to the rest of the facility. The facility is just like Lego bricks and can be configured just to meet the, your needs. 
So we have a supply and a fueling storage to do fast refueling. We have the station module, so that's basically the pump with the compressor, the cooling and the control. And what you will see is the dispenser, which can be placed wherever you actually need it to do the operations like David mentioned in the first presentation, to do more or less exactly what you do with diesel. And fueling buses, we have a, a project in, uh, in London with TFL where we fuel the buses in less than five minutes for one day of operation. But of course, if you fuel a little bit more, it will take you longer. What we typically see is that it will take between six and eight minutes to fuel for more than one day of operation. As Nina mentioned, some of the big cities, if not all, in Denmark did a pledge to only do zero emission from 2021. Ongoing tenders, uh, this example is from, from Aalborg, where we could see that, uh, as I understand the, the requirements there, you will be building a completely new depot. So from scratch, and you will, if you do battery electric buses, will also invest in the entire infrastructure and do all that. That investment, if you do hydrogen, is some one that we will take. So Everfuel as a company will finance everything and you will only pay per kilogram. I've looked at the, the demand that we see up there. It's a 10 year contract with possible extension of two plus two years, start of operation in 2022, 88 buses, 13 BRTs and 10 additional buses. That gives you just some, some numbers. On average, just below two tons of hydrogen every day. In order to do that, we would set up these Lego bricks. So that's the station modules. Each of those are connected directly to a dispenser and our design philosophy based on the hardware from, from Nell Hydrogen, which we know very well because we were part of the development of that, is that we always do the N plus one. So if you have the need of having three dispensers to do the service, we would be doing four. So you always have a backup. The trailers I showed you just before will then be parked at the facility. So th each of these contains 1.1 ton of hydrogen this one as well, and this one as well. And then we leave one bay open so we can easily do the exchange. So on average, you would be using just roughly two trailers every day, but we do this to optimize the logistics and you can have a smooth operation in a flexible location at the depot, for instance, in Oldbrook. I think that's it. So I'll be gladly taking questions if you have any. Thank you very much. And I think it's now over to Nathan and Lars. Hi again, thanks, thanks Lars. Um, I'm now here to, to give an overview of after sales support and we know to our customers this is a key thing. There's obviously the process of developing new markets, selling buses is very, very exciting, particularly for me. Um, but the, the main thing is that the buses can um, operate on a daily basis and you're going to look after buses. We have bus contracts in the UK that are seven years, 10 years, 15 years in Hong Kong and Singapore. Our buses are under warranty for 18 or 19 years and have also gone full through full life cycle costs. So we understand that we are here to support you for every day that you have to have the bus through the service process. Um, for us, we have an array of mechanisms we utilize to try and support our customers depending on the regions. Um, the process is supported primarily through custom care. The custom care uh, is headed up by an ex-JCB employee um, called Ian Gillett. In the UK, Ireland, Hong Kong and Singapore, we use a mechanism where Rightbus directly um, set up companies and uh, support our operators directly and our customers directly. But where appropriate, we've also looked at um, utilizing the JCB family owned dealership network, the independent JCB network or other uh, dealer networks if appropriate. But for the Danish market, the strategy is very much to uh, for us to set up our own company, but leverage the fact that Ballard is logistically and geographically placed in a position of strength and to use that as a base. So for us, what our plan are is that we would effectively set up our own uh, support network based out of Ballard with our own employees. So different solutions that we can give our customers uh, from an after sales perspective, we can offer an array of different solutions and products. We can offer full repair and maintenance contracts. We can offer parts assurance where effectively we will provide the parts when you do the labor yourself that we can train you for. Or 
we can offer just warranty service. But with your standard warranty service, you will get a regional service manager who will be your point of contact if you have any issues. Um, you will also be assigned a mobile service engineer. That will be a local Danish uh, service engineer who will be based and mobile in a van like the one you see in the image. This van allows our service engineer to go on site and to fix the vast majority of problems on site instead of having to send a bus back to a depot, which is common in some other and other businesses. This van is also equipped with some consumable information and consumable parts, which he can actually sell on a daily basis. We've got 24 seven service support. We've got a dedicated service app. We've got uh, ability to provide genuine OEM approved parts. And we can also provide manuals and training. One of the benefits of what we can do is in the UK, we have used City and Guilds, which is an independent third party accreditation to actually train up um, our technicians for our operators, technicians to an approved standard, an independently led standard um, and also service reviews. So your regional service manager who you'll be appointed with will conduct a quarterly service review with you. And that's one of the key metrics in custom care is how the performance of that and how quick we are to respond and improve upon uh, the customer satisfaction during the service reviews. So as I said, our, our strategy for Denmark would very much be to employ a mobile service engineer, have a regional service managers based out of Ballard and, and ben leveraging the fact that Ballard geographically is positioned very well uh, to support the Danish market. I'm now going to talk hand over to Lars uh, to talk through uh, the benefits and on, of, of Ballard and their uh, geographical uh, location. Your sound is off, Lars. We still don't hear you. Just see if Lars is getting his sound on, or maybe we can ask David to jump in. Yeah, I'll try and jump in if you just give me a second. Just uh, get into the presentation. So maybe I should start, David, I can make the introduction to Ballard. So Ballard Power System, we are, as Nathan has mentioned a couple of times, we are supplying the fuel cell modules for the buses of Right Bus. And we have our European headquarter located in Hobro in Denmark, uh, where we have had more than 10 years of experience with maintaining all fuel cell electric buses powered by Ballard's technology across Europe. And today we have six senior technicians uh, focused on the doing bus service and uh, performing all support and, and maintenance on the buses uh, running across Europe uh, from Bala. And we have three different bus manufacturers right now deploying fuel cell buses in Europe, where Ride Bus is one of them, obviously, very, very heavily uh, represented in the UK. Our technicians are uh, fully understanding uh, how the bus operations and maintenance schedules work. And we have set up the team 
the customer care team of Ballard in Denmark to be able to reply with urgent response if anything fails during operation. We 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 put a high importance on the availability of our customers and the operators' buses in the field. We do perform all spare part uh, stocking in out of our office in Hobro, out of our facilities in Hobro for for Europe, and we have local service presence in different satellite areas in in across Europe. We do set up uh, service offices uh, near to large fleets when necessary. All repair on the modules will also happen directly out of the European office. And we also do work closely with different partners in order to avoid uh, delays uh, of uh, servicing and parts assurance across Europe. I'm not sure, David, if you want to take over from here to discuss about the special toolkits uh, that we have built for the workshops. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. So. Um, Thank you, Nina. The we have lots of uh, lots of experience. If you in in maintaining hydrogen fuel cell buses, Ballard Europe have been doing this for ten years, um, and Ballard itself has been in the industry for forty two years. So we're not talking about a new technology here. We're talking about something that we know. Um, as far as upskilling technicians is concerned, can you? Put that slide on, please, Nina. Technician upskilling is obviously very important because the maintenance is a of a bus is, is basically down, down to the technician. So Ballard have training in three different levels. So we have different tiers of training as, as we call them. So we have a, a, a basic level which is really an overview for all technicians. And then we have a, a, a tier two training, which is for those technicians that would be taking on the regular maintenance, some of the repair work. But then we have a tier three training, which is, which is a sort of master technician type training. But we'll always be there to support you on, on your uh, fuel cell bus journey. And we will always provide ongoing training and lots of um and we'll be here for for remote support and if necessary on-site support we'll always we'll always help you through your troubleshooting often when you take up operating a new technology it feels like you're the first person to ever do this some of the problems you're going to come across you may not have seen before but we have experience within ourselves within right bus that we all have the experience and you may not have seen an, an issue before, but we may well have done. So by by having a, a, a good contact with the with the operators, we can get any problems uh, sorted out very quickly. If you could go on to the next slide, please, Nina. So what we're what we really want to do, um, and it's our aim, is to have a very successful project project execution. We will support you in the preparation of your workshop. We can support you in the in the preparation of your procedures. An, an operator knows how their how their depot works. So we wouldn't want to interfere in how in how that's done. But we can we can we can give examples of what's been done elsewhere and everything else. So we can we can make drafts up together and then the operator can um, put things together in in the way they want to. So the the maintenance of the buses works to to how the operator wants it. We, we have connections with uh, relevant safety organisations. We've dealt with them before. We, we know what to do in various uh, locations and jurisdictions to know what to do to make the, to make the, the operation safe. And really, it's our aim to have a, a successful fuel cell bus operation. We all want the same thing. We all want the buses to... Um, go out in the morning, run all day, come home in the evening, get fueled, washed, and then only have to go through their normal preventative maintenance scheme. 
So I hope that gave you a brief overview. Um, back to you, Nina. Thank you, David. And uh, thanks for stepping in here. What a shame Lars's um, microphone didn't work, but, but uh, thank you for, for taking over here. And hopefully we can get Lars up and running, or he may be able to reply to some of the questions more related to the servicing in the chat directly. Well, we also saw that we had quite a few questions coming in during the webinar. This is really cool and much appreciated. And please feel free to type in more questions in the chat box if you have any. But um, let's start with the questions. Um, I will uh, start with a question to Everfuel, to Lars from Everfuel. And I see you also, Lars, have already started answering some of the questions, with it, which is pretty great. I couldn't stop. You couldn't stop. <laughs> But the first question here to you uh, is, what is the price of hydrogen compared to diesel <clears> and electricity calculated in relation to consumption per kilometer driven? Is that something you can elaborate a bit on? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, using not even the fantastic numbers that uh, Nathan showed on, uh, on, on the actual uh, on the consumption, but uh, we, we normally calculate with seven, so you're already uh, way way below that, uh, Nathan. So that's really good. But if we use those numbers and as the example I showed with the scale, for instance, in oil bowl, so the thing about hydrogen is it's better at scale. It's not good for two, three, four buses because the investment is rather big. But if we do it at at scale, we can actually be on kilometer driven basis lower than diesel compared to uh, battery electric buses. There's a, a exemption on tariffs in Denmark. So there it's, it's, uh, it's more expensive than that, but uh, I don't know if that will change, but uh, as, as we see it, at least we are below diesel and we compare ourselves to diesel. Thank you, Lars, that was a good answer here. And then I had a question I would di direct it to you, Nathan. There are several questions related to the same topic, but I'll start with what is the daily range? I think you answered it in your presentation that is optimally and realistically achievable. And then I have an additional one here. Are the H2 bus sensitive to cold slash frost weather? Um, okay, so thanks thanks for that, Nina. Um, what I would say is we have two different strategies for range um, and for the double deck or the single deck. The single deck range is not really an issue. We've got four tank, five tank or six tank arrangement depending on what the energy demand is for the route. As I said, we have WTEC, our, our research facility, which will do the analysis before that to determine what is the optimum uh, tank strategy to support that. Will the AEs we ever feel then to work out that position? You know, if you look at a sort three driveline cycle at 18 kilometers per hour and a very high capacity requirement, energy requirement, you get in London or Hong Kong with 23 hours of duty, even four tanks is probably enough to get that kind of, um, that kind of range. But, you know, around the 400 kilometer range it is probably okay, but it just depends on what city it is and what's the energy requirements. Are you going for, you know, a low speed sort one cycle, sort two, sort three? It depends on, on what it is uh, that your request is. But as I said, we think we're uniquely positioned. We do a lot of high level detailed research before uh, the vehicles would go into operation. And uh, we do a lot of telematics uh, studies on the routes, and then we'll be able to determine that for you. Um, with regards to the second question that Nina uh, mentioned around the frost, um, as I said, real world data right now is the vehicles, our Gen 2, are in operation in Aberdeen. They're performing really, really well. Um, and they've had to perform at minus 20 degrees uh, Celsius uh, temperature, which is, is pretty much on the outer edges of extreme. And they performed really, really well. Not any real impact in range uh, because we're getting the free heat from the Ballard uh, fuel cell. One thing we would say with this generation of fuel cell, which is the HD7, is we have to do the overnight plug-in charge for that vehicle, but that is not required as we move to the FC Move fuel cell, which is another progressive step in trying to make uh, fuel cells uh, totally comparative to other zero emission solutions. Thank you, Nathan. I think you also here answered, can extra hydrogen tanks be installed for extra mileage? I heard you saying between four to six tanks, depending on the range requirements. Yeah. yeah. I then have a, a very interesting question here from, I would assume it is the transit agency. 
saying our tenders of bus services are open for any zero emission technology, but we haven't seen any hydrogen buses yet. Why is that? I think I would start asking David this question, but maybe also directed to you, Lars, because I know you've been very involved in analyzing Danish tenders lately. So David, would, do you mind taking a side on this? Um, well, I, I would say that that's a good question. Um, to be honest, I don't I don't know why you haven't seen any hydrogen buses. There are some routes that may may fall very very easily into battery electric buses. There are some routes that that battery electric buses aren't so good. I, I would I would uh, seriously question why there hasn't been more of a take up of hydrogen fuel cell fuel cell buses. A lot of the time when people talk about zero emission, they 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 immediately think of battery electric buses. That is a that is a um, an issue that that we have. And people don't always always think that there's hydrogen buses there. And another issue issue is that people often think that the hydrogen buses isn't isn't a mature technology. Yet it is a mature technology. And I, I've been I ran hydrogen buses in London um for 10 years so i know that the buses work i know i know it's all there i know the lessons have been learned because i learned a lot of them myself so things have moved on so in my opinion hydrogen fuel cell buses should come up in people's um people's radar when they're looking at zero emission tenders and i believe that you you should look at look at the the service that the bus has to perform to decide what technology is the best technology to use. Thanks, yeah. David. Do you have anything to add, Lars? Maybe one thing that uh, goes beyond. Uh, I will not focus so much on the buses, but more on the on the tariffs and the exemptions. If, if we did not have that uh, exemption from tariffs on on electricity in Denmark, I'm sure you would have already seen fuel cell buses operating in Denmark under commercial tenders. It's, it's the same thing we also see in the Netherlands. I know that uh, we also have some participants from the Netherlands here where the HPE schemes is, is already set up for renewable electricity. That's not already existing for, for, for hydrogen. So if we have level playing fields, I'm sure you will see more hydrogen buses in, in, in operation. And that's not me complaining. It's just me stating some facts. Thank you, both Lars and David. I think those are very thorough answers to that question. Well, David, while we have you on the spot, I also have a few more questions uh, related to the to the setting up of the depot and 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 how to service the hydrogen. We have a question here stating, how can we adapt our existing bus depot to refuel and service a fleet of hydrogen buses? Okay, so if we take the fuel inside first, um, Lars. Lars is the man to ask about the fueling, but very basically, the fueling set up would be set up in a compound, and actually, the the process of fueling the bus is very similar to fueling a diesel bus. So you have a, a nozzle that goes onto onto the bus, and then then the bus fills up with hydrogen. So the fueling side is very simple. As far as the maintenance is concerned. Obviously, we have we have new hazards that we're introducing by by having the hydrogen fuel cell bus. In the same way, when you've got a battery electric bus, you've got new hazards. So we're we're talking really about three three items that that a bus depot that just runs diesel buses may may not have come across. The first is high voltage because we're we're talking uh, a hydrogen fuel cell electric bus. And that high voltage is the same precautions that you'd have to take for a battery electric bus. So that doesn't that that doesn't change there. You you're talking about about some some high pressure because the in the in the tanks on the bus the the hydrogen is stored at 350 uh, 
350 bar, 35 megapascals. So, so that that's a um, there are there is some high pressure around in a in a diesel bus depot, but not possibly not in those those quantities. However, it's always got to be remembered that that the high pressure system is a sealed system, so you shouldn't really be be coming across the high pressure on a day to day basis. And the third thing is obviously the hydrogen itself. Well, we understand the hydrogen and property, the properties of hydrogen very, very well. So some sort of adaptations that you might need in the depot are some sort of hydrogen alarm to detect if there is there is a hydrogen leak. And that's particularly um, relevant if, when you're undertaking maintenance, because because, again, you've got a sealed system. So when you're doing maintenance, you may you may need be looking at that system in some way. Um, it's it's good to have some sort of venting. We know hydrogen is going to go up, so if it goes up, you don't want it to gather to create a flammable a flammable mixture. And so, if we have venting, we can let the hydrogen go out to atmosphere, so that doesn't arise. And again, that can be connected to the alarm system. And then some little simple things like um, certainly having a, a ground connection cable when the bus is worked on and things. But the main thing to work on is the the training of the technicians and your work processes. The any 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 alarms etc. are your last line of defence. You don't even want to get that far. So you so you deal with with things before that but we do have a informational guide on our on ballard's website that gives you a lot of details about the the hydrogen maintenance and what you need to do about that great well now you mentioned the training maybe this is also a question for nathan so so we have some questions related to where can the training happen how do i get my technicians trained um, so as I said, we've got a, a range of solutions um, and a range of different packages for support. So we, and obviously COVID again has added an additional level of complexity into that, uh, but we have on-site training and we have then further training um, actually uh, in the technician's operation. Um, obviously there's been some challenges with getting on-site visits during the pandemic uh, for COVID secure reasons, but we expect that to, to alleviate. We bring people in we, we conduct the training. And as I said, we're also looking at the possibility of doing a city and guilds version of that training um, that we can effectively get your people tested then and approved to a qualification process for that type of training. So that's something that, that we think would be something to move forward with um, as well. So uh, we've got a range of solutions and it says we're, we've become even more flexible over the last 12 months because of the, the pandemic. Thank you, Nathan. I see we have Three three minutes left, so I'll take take one last question here, and um, I will address it to you, Lars Jacobson. We have what evidence do you have that operators are using emission free green hydrogen, for example, generated by renewables, or grey hydrogen from gas or coal or blue? Uh, uh, yeah. So and and they come in all shapes and sizes, by the way. So um, so it, it's it's getting more and more complicated. But in some of our sources, <clears throat> we actually connect directly to renewables. So there, there you don't have to answer any questions. Otherwise, um, the nature of how we actually produce hydrogen is we do electrolysis. And uh, the, the key driver on actually producing hydrogen is electricity. <clears throat> if you look at the renewables energy system, the more energy is in the system, the lower the cost. And that's when the wind is blowing. So that helps us a lot on, on that. In order to make it 100% sure, we actually certify it. So we use certificates of origin as well. But that's already in addition to what we do on the production side. All right. Thank you, Lars. And it's good to see and great to see that we still have a lot of questions coming in. So maybe if I can ask Lars, Nathan and David to just reply to a few of them before you leave this webinar, that would be great. But I think we have to end the question from here and then I will just do a summary. So we are at the end of the webinar and I would really like to thank all the presenters again for excellent presentations but also a huge thank you to all of you for attending and for the many great questions that we've received so if you are interested in exploring the opportunities to deploy buses in your fleets or in your city uh, please reach out to the h2 bus consortium and we're more than happy to set up separate meetings to discuss further 
we will share the material. I think we had Bettina uh, sharing this information uh, after the webinar, and we will include uh, contact details for each of the presenters. So we hope you've enjoyed this webinar and that you'll become much more aware about the readiness of the fuel cell buses, that the, the, the role they can play in the decarbonization of the public transportation. And I think based on today's presentation, it is fair to state that the zero emission fuel cell bus solution is ready. The buses are ready. The price is affordable. And we have the whole fuel cell electric bus value chain lined up to support the customers, not only in Denmark, but also in the rest of Europe. And with that, I'd like to say thank you, everyone. Yeah.